Hey everyone, and I hope everybody's having a great weekend and been enjoying the beautiful weather uh, that we've been blessed with this, with this weekend. Uh, we're going to begin a brand new series um, entitled Nehemiah. And uh, before we even dive into that, I'm going to say something that I, I think probably a lot of people, maybe, maybe not, we'll just see, but struggle really to believe in this idea. Um, but I mean it, um, what I'm about to say here, is that I believe, and what we're going to see is that Every person, every single person, everybody that is worshiping with us this weekend, everybody we come in contact is a person of extraordinary influence. Uh, Within your circle of influence, on your day-to-day life and the things you're involved in, all of us have extraordinary influence. And you might think there's nothing extraordinary about me or nothing extraordinary about our lives or nothing extraordinary about what we do. But extraordinary influence doesn't just start where we might think it does. And I think that's probably um, why we maybe struggle to believe in that idea that we actually can have or do have extraordinary influence. is because the idea or the thought behind that. So what I want to do is, like I said, I, I want to just talk about the life of Nehemiah. And I want to begin with Nehemiah verse, chapter 1, verse 1. Um, this weekend, where it says, In late autumn, in the month of Kislev, in the twelfth year of King Xerxes' reign, I was at the fortress of Susa. Now his name is Nehemiah, and he lives in the city of Susa. Now Susa was the capital of the ancient Persian Empire, the dominant power in the world at that time. Now when it says the twentieth year, That's the 20th year of the reign of Emperor Xerxes. Now, Nehemiah wasn't Persian. He was actually Hebrew, actually from the country of Judah. So here's how he got to Persia. See, before Nehemiah was born, the Babylonian Empire conquered the country of Judah and resettled many of the people in other parts of the Babylonian Empire. Then the Persian Empire came along and conquered the Babylonian Empire. So Nehemiah's people became part of the Persian Empire. I want to go ahead and read on, if you look with me, in, uh, as we continue in chapter 1 of Nehemiah, where it says, While I was in Citadel, Hananiah, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that survived the exile. And also about Jerusalem. They said to me, Those who survived the exile are back in the province, are back in the province, are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates have been burned with fire. Now Nehemiah's story revolves around a wall. It revolves around the wall of Jerusalem. And the wall was such a big deal. Because in those days, the wall of a city was the most important part of the city. The wall protected you from the invaders. So really nothing could go in or out of the city without the protection. But you had to have the wall, the wall protect, so they, they, to protect them, so to keep them safe, so you couldn't go in and out without going out in a designated area. In those, days, in those days, a city was never any better than its wall. So Nehemiah hears about Jerusalem and watch his response. Look what it says there in verse 4. It says, When I heard these things, I sat down and I wept. For some days I mourned and I fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Now, this isn't just an emotional reaction. This is the beginning of Nehemiah's influence. So I want you to highlight or actually circle or do whatever you need to 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 mark this specific verse. This is the beginning of Nehemiah's influence. It doesn't look like maybe the influence that we are actually thinking about, but this is the beginning of Nehemiah's influence. Nehemiah's influence began on the ground, weeping, mourning, fasting, praying. Again, not what we would think about people of great influence, right? Now, 
I don't know about you, but my mind, every time I read this, no matter how many times I've read this or preached or talked, or it, it still goes back to the same question. So uh, maybe you, you're wondering the same question. Why is he so broken about a wall? Why is he so upset about this crazy wall? So what if the wall is broken? So what if, if it's in ruins? What's the big deal? Why is he so upset? Well, it all starts back at Jerusalem. You see, Jerusalem wasn't just the capital of his home country. It was the place where the, the, for the temple of God. And when we think about temple, I just don't want you to think about just a, a temple uh, like you've seen one, you've, you've seen them all. There had never been anything like this temple in all of history. It was a big deal. It was a huge deal. It was the center of what God was up to in the world. And all the world would look to this temple in Jerusalem. It was magnificent. It was tr extraordinary. So no wall for the city meant there was no way the temple could function like it was supposed to. And no way um, could, things, could the things of God happen the way they were supposed to. So Jerusalem wall was a very big deal. But there's still something puzzling about Nehemiah's reaction. The wall had been torn down. Now listen, this. the wall had been um, in ruins uh, for 141 years. Think about that for a minute. 141 years. Nehemiah's reaction is like, why now? Why is he so upset now? You know, uh, why is he so emotional now? Now, some say that maybe it was the first time that he'd heard about the wall, but maybe that's the case. Maybe, maybe that is. Maybe it is the first time he'd heard about the shape of the wall of Jerusalem. Um, maybe that, that's, maybe, maybe, I, I really don't know, but maybe these guys were the first people he'd ever met who'd actually seen the condition of the wall. Maybe he'd heard some things about the wall, but these were the first people he'd actually been around that actually had physically, personally seen the wall to actually bring back the exact description to him. Or maybe for Nehemiah, maybe because he is a person of faith and he's allowed God in his relationship with God to move and work in his life, maybe some other interesting stuff is going on. I don't know. Maybe God is speaking to him in a new way. Maybe stuff's going on in him spiritually, um, just to the point where he's now hearing about it. He's hearing about people that have actually experienced the wall, and so it's all welling up in him. It's maybe not that he's hearing it for the very first time, but he's actually, with everything that God's been preparing for, God's been moving and doing in his life, and now he's hearing it from people that have actually seen or experienced it. I don't know, but for whatever reason, this is a big deal for Nehemiah. This is a big deal for Nehemiah. Nehemiah is upset, and this matters. But see, Nehemiah's influence doesn't start with extraordinary talents or extraordinary resources. I want us to notice, and you can write this down in, in, in your notes, um, it starts with his heart. Nehemiah's heart was totally broken for the things of God. See, there's a parallel, I believe, between the condition of Jerusalem in those days and the condition of where we live, where God has planted each and every one of us today. Jerusalem was the hope of the world, finding its way back to God. The world finding its way back to God was through seeing through God in the temple in Jerusalem. The world was sinking farther and farther into spiritual darkness, and Nehemiah saw that. Nehemiah felt that. Nehemiah was living in that. And I think God wants something like that to actually happen within each and every one of us. Now, I don't think any of us would argue with the fact that over the past 15 to 20 years, and, and just realization, and I've seen it in my lifetime, is that we have become more keenly aware 
of all the horrific tragedies that are going on in this world. I know in the times that I've had the opportunities to travel outside of the United States, to travel uh, on various mission trips and different things. Um, I was always kind of specific when I started doing it early on. It always uh, was interesting to me how much of the rest of the world knew about us as Americans, but really as Americans, we actually knew about them and what we would hear about them. And it's been interesting because of, I, I was able to, um, to be in that a little bit, to be in that circle, if you will. Looking back on it now, 15, 20 years removed from that or seeing that and seeing now how much we have evolved to where we actually see so much um, what's going on in the world, whether good, bad, or indifferent. Um, but specifically, we are very much aware now, even where we're at in America, of the horrific, the tragic things that are going on in the world. And let's just throw it out there. A lot of times when we hear about those that are hungry, those that are starving, those that are struggling, whatever, for whatever reason, our hearts break for that. And there's times of, uh, that we've been able to be generous and contribute to that, and we want to help in that. We hear about uh, the human suffering, uh, you know, the human trafficking, and, and all these different things, and our hearts are tugged at that. It tugs at our hearts. It pulls at us. And therefore, when we have an opportunity to get involved or to help in those certain areas, we do so. And that's amazing, and that's awesome. But I think I'm probably going to say something that's probably about to hit a nerve that... For some of you, you probably will have to take a step back, maybe even a little offensive to you, that you're probably going to have to process through maybe this week, is that when, when someone near me or someone near you is far from God, let me say that again, when someone near me or someone near you is far from God, it is just as serious a thing as someone suffering from whatever we experience, whatever we see from all around the world, whether it be from disease or suppression or repression or malnutrition or whatever that looks like in the rest of the other parts of the world. When someone near me or you is far from God, it's just a serious thing. And I know I think in our minds that maybe we're thinking, okay, and we'll try to process that. And we might not be willing to say we don't believe that. But I don't know if we really actually believe that. I don't know how much we really believe that a person living a life that is yet to, that is far, let me just say, that is far outside of a relationship with God, that's not, that's not been introduced to a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, that's not been introduced to a transformational life, I don't know if we really believe that they're in as bad a shape or that, that we believe that that is so important to God, that that breaks the heart of God. See, so much of the misery, misery so much of the hopelessness, despair, the conditions of people's lives have so much to do with how they have not found or no one's introduced them to relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And now more than ever, we have no excuse for anybody in the world, let alone our neighbor, and not to be introduced to a life transformational opportunity to experience a relationship with God through Jesus. But the question is, do we believe it? We hear all the tragedies in the world. We hear people that are struggling, people that are starving, people that are struggling with water, and we see the opportunities to give to that. People that struggle with clothing, people are struggling with shoes. We see opportunities to give to that. And I'm not saying we shouldn't. That's part of who we are. That's part of our DNA. That's what God wants from us. But the realization also that it should break our hearts that for people, from our neighbors, for our circle of influence, for the people we come in contact on a day-to-day -day basis that are outside, do we wonder, do they have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ? Are they walking with a relationship with God through Jesus? Here's something I just want, I think all of us need to be reminded of. 
Over in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, it says, Dear friends, the Lord is not slow in keeping His promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. I think we all need to be reminded what matters most to God. Specifically right now in our world and our culture today, what matters so much to God? What matters most to God? What breaks the heart of God should break our hearts as well. If you are a follower of Christ, whenever you made the decision to surrender your life to Christ and connecting with God, if you're willing to allow God to transform and move and live in a transformational life change with God on not just a, 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 a month or a year plan, but on a day-by-day -day plan, What's breaking the heart of God should break our hearts. See, Nehemiah's heart broke for the city of Jerusalem and the things of God. See, with a heart that breaks for the things that breaks the heart of God, not just around the world, but where we live and where we do life on a day-to-day -day basis. So, I want you to, us to look, and we have to look in, in, inside. We have to uh, look ourselves in the mirror and say, what breaks the heart of God? Is it, does it break our hearts? Look at where we're focusing, in our neighborhoods, um, our circle of influence, our family. When you drive where you live, when you're driving to or from work, if that's the case for you. And I know during the pandemic, a lot of us will have to work from home now, but even from that, setting aside maybe the people that you can envision that, of knowing as you that path that you would drive to work, of knowing what you're passing by, or to or maybe you had the opportunity to get out a little bit and, and go to the mall or you go to the store. Or while you're maybe even be able to even, if it's even outside, sitting outside at a restaurant, or maybe it's in the line at a drive through Have you ever asked yourself or start to look around them and say, you know, I wonder, how, I wonder how these people are doing. Have you ever just stopped and thought that realization is, hey, not everybody around me is doing okay. There are people around me right now that their hearts are broken. Their families are broken. Their lives are broken. They're struggling mentally, physically, spiritually, financially. They're just broken. People broken by despair, depression. They feel meaningless. They're broken. Have you ever just stopped and realized that, hey, the world that we think may look okay, even in the world that we're in, is not. And that breaks the heart of God. And we have to realize that. That breaks the heart of God. And because it breaks the heart of God, it should break our heart as well. It's just unacceptable that someone is suffering far and is far from God. And someone's suffering and don't have the opportunity to hear the good news, to hear about Jesus, to be connected. And, and I realize that not everybody right now is wanting to, to hear, to open up our Bibles and to hear maybe Jesus read from Scripture. Eventually, it will work its way to that. But what I'm talking about is that we, are, we as followers of Christ, we're the hands, we're the feet, we're the mouths, we're the ears. We are the body of Christ. We are the example to the world, the, 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 the world that we live in, our, our circle of influence. We're the example of Christ doing life, just touching. And I realize in our society and culture days with this pandemic, it's hard to touch. It's hard to make this contacts. But being the example that we need to be, what breaks the heart of God should break our heart as well. God doesn't want to see anyone broken and to perish for lack of Him. It breaks His heart. 
And for us to have the influence in this world where we're meant to have, we need to have the heart that breaks the heart of God. That's what I mean when I talk about at the very beginning of this message of having this extraordinary influence. Each and every one of us has the opportunity to have this extraordinary influence when we allow what breaks the heart of God to break our heart as well. Because what we're going to see through this series, through the life of Nehemiah, but as his heart was broken, that he just didn't let it sit there, that it welled up inside of him. And we're going to see how and what stirred him up and what took place in the life of, specific time in the life of Nehemiah that was forever changing. But I want to draw us here as we close out this weekend back to a challenge that I threw out to us several weeks ago in a a previous series. At the very end of a specific sermon that I preached, I I just threw out a challenge to everyone, everybody um, that was um, in worship that weekend. Here was the challenge. Uh, Number one, here, number one was this. Are you willing to start seeking God and how you can make a difference? Are you willing to step out of our comfort zone, out of our, 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 whatever it looks like. Are you willing to step out of that comfort zone? Are you willing to take a risk? Are you willing to put your fears behind you and to start seeking God and how God can make a difference? In other words, are we willing to start to ask God how He wants us to be extraordinary influencers? Number two, this was the second challenge. Make every effort to pray daily. In other words, to be intentionally setting aside a time daily, praying, seeking God on uh, how to make a difference, how to be this extraordinary influencer. Number three, here's the third challenge. To make every effort to fast weekly along with being intentional about setting aside a time of prayer, seeking how God wants us to make a difference. Are we willing to fast weekly? Now, fasting is a biblical principle that Jesus, now listen to this, that Jesus assumed we would do. He actually said, whenever you fast. In other words, when Jesus, these are Jesus' words. He said, whenever you fast, when, by saying that, whenever, I would just assume and thinking that he's saying, thinking to us, okay, that he's not assuming that, oh, flippantly, well, we'll decide we'll fast or not. No, you're fasting. Because it says, whenever you fast, and then he goes on to say how, what that should look like. And you can Go back and research that, and I'll let you do that homework on your own. But are you fasting? And then the fourth challenge was this. As you're praying, as you're setting aside intentional time daily, asking God and listening to God and seeking God on how you can make a difference, how He wants to use you to rise up this, to be this extraordinary influencer that your heart will break like His heart breaks, as you're praying intentionally daily, as you're fasting, setting aside a time weekly to fast, that also that you're making every effort to tithe, to give back into God's church, to give back into His bride. And if you're already tithing, then you're giving an offering. Then you're giving an offering. In other words, you're giving, you're, you're making every opportunity to be generous, to give back into God's mission. That challenge I issued several weeks ago at the very end of a message. And I want to issue that challenge back to us this weekend. As we close out this first message in this series on Nehemiah, here's the challenge for us. Um, I hope you'll take on this challenge. Let me encourage you um, in this challenge. And uh, I look forward to seeing how Nehemiah the story of Nehemiah and how God's going to work through this story, through this series over this upcoming month. I hope you guys have the rest of your weekend is awesome. Enjoy the weather and I'll see you guys soon.